my name is Megan with Swift Paws. And if you can see her in the background, Piper's back there as well. That's my pup. I'm super excited today because we are actually getting together on a video call. I wish we could be in person. Um, and before I introduce you to Aaron, I want to tell you why I'm on this call. Uh, at Swift Paws, something near and dear to my heart is being able to connect with charitable organizations, rescue shelters, uh, a foster and adoption groups all over the country and we are finally able to start expanding what i call our charitable partners program and the maryland spca is one of our very first charitable partners so we were able to donate some of our swift pause home equipment when we get returns we refurbish them we make sure that they're as good as new and then we donate them to uh shelters organizations nonprofit rescues so that they can use them for the dogs in their care and I'm excited then to introduce you to Aaron. And Aaron is actually a trainer and behavior consultant for the Maryland SPCA. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I, I love pet enrichment. Swift Pod's mission is to get pets active and moving and stimulate them both mentally and physically. And when I uh, originally was introduced to Maryland SPCA, so we're all the way down in Florida. You guys are kind of at the opposite end there. Um, however, when I was introduced, I found that you actually have an enrichment program at the SPCA, which I think is kind of unique. Not every shelter has one. So tell me a little bit about your enrichment program. Yeah, of course. So we um, are very big on behavior training enrichment. Um, our focus as an organization is not only, you know, uh, increasing um, the adoptability of animals, decreasing length of stay in a shelter. Shelters are obviously very, very stressful environments. And while it's not a home and there's going to be stress, um, it's just inevitable. We want to make the quality of life for our animals, both behaviorally and physically, um, as positive as possible. So we try to incorporate um, not only training and brain games and things like that, but um, active enrichment as well. So play groups are a thing that um, we unfortunately took a little bit of a back burner with COVID and staffing um, has decreased a bit, but play groups um, are great. It, it meets social needs for animals. Um, it gets them out and about getting uh, physical exercise and activities. Some dogs, however, we found don't really enjoy playgroups. Maybe they are a little bit more on the dog selective side, or they would rather engage in um, other activities. We used to use items like flirt poles um, to still get dogs active, especially those that really enjoy chasing things. Um, we can use those in our fun run play yards. Um, but it still, you know, was sometimes a little bit on the frustrating side for them, or maybe they weren't getting quite as much engagement as we would hope. Um, and we have found that with the lore course, it gives them not only more room to move around, um, but we can kind of, uh, with the pulley systems, um, make different patterns, um, going in different directions. So it kind of keeps it, makes it a little bit more natural and organic, like as if they were actually chasing an item. Um, so that's been really awesome to see. Um, Obviously, we also have some animals that are on activity restrictions, maybe they're on um, heart room treatments or older geriatric orthopedic, so that might not be an option for them. So for those, we might have more low-key things. Um, we have a training room that sometimes will bring those animals out, give them a little break from the kennel setup. Um, we'll set up food puzzles, uh, kind of free work areas where we put scent articles and different things out so they can roam around at their leisure and sniff, um, explore some things. Things. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of different fun things and even just walks around the property. I like to call them snafaris, let them just kind of pick wherever they want, go in any direction, sniff things. If they want to spend five minutes just sniffing, you know, a fire hydrant, great. That's their prerogative. <laughs> sniff walk before, but I've never heard snafari. So I am now using that. <laughs> awesome. And I, I love to hear that for you, enrichment is not necessarily just a strictly training program because, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing when you bring a dog into a shelter and they need to learn how to be a good canine citizen and, and get into a home and not be destructive or be potty trained. It's one thing to do that kind of training or even obedience training. And it's another thing altogether to provide them with enrichment to keep them both mentally and physically stimulated. And I think that for a lot of shelters, it's something that if they're not doing it right now, it's something that they wish they could do. And, you know, depending on the size and how much of an active volunteer base you have, it's not 
always possible for a shelter to have a full-on enrichment program. So even for uh, smaller shelters or shelters that don't have as many resources, it's awesome that there are options, like like you said, providing like a, a snuffle mat or op options that don't take up a lot of space. Maybe they don't have giant play yards or just taking them on those sniffaries. I think that's fantastic. Do you find, and this is something that we talk about a lot with Swift Paws and when we're working with our charitable partners, one of the big problems that a lot of uh, shelters experience are those dogs that keep coming back. So they may find a great home, they go into that home in the first week or two weeks or even month is awesome and then the dog finds its way back to the shelter because it hasn't worked out in that family. Have you found an impact on return rates by implementing your enrichment programs? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actively monitor and track and are constantly looking at statistics of um, not only the length of stay in the actual shelter, but um, the amount of animals getting adopted out and the amount of returns. And we have found that it has gone down because one of the biggest things is, you know, we want obviously to not only get to know that individual animal, sometimes when they're so stressed out and shut down, you don't really know the animal. You don't know what motivates them um, or if they're, you know, dog, more dog social, more people social. Um, so when we look at um, what we call the FAS or fear, anxiety, and stress scale, um, and we try to actively rate that and monitor that. And um, what we do is uh, basically for those animals that we find are maybe a little bit higher on the FAS uh, scale, we want to minimize that. So we would start on some behavior meds, um, start active, trying to find things that really motivate them, um, whether it be, again, a play group or just bringing them into a quiet space and letting them do compress, moving them to an office. Um, and we find that when we offer different options, choices for the animals, and then novel enrichment, it decreases the FAS and it actually makes them more receptive to behavior modification and training. And we get to know the animal um, a little bit better. So that way we can make those necessary recommendations or even in some cases restrictions. So for some of our dogs, you know, we're in the middle of the city, Baltimore City, um, we find that that environment can be really, really stressful for them. So for some animals, we found, okay, they love to run around. They like to do the lower course and the um, flirt pole and play groups, but the city's just super overwhelming. So we might recommend that they go to a more quiet space and things like that. And when we're able to gather that information and um, minimize that animal's stress level greatly, they get out of the shelter faster. So they're a lot um, more receptive and able to decompress a little bit more faster in that home. Um, Cause sometimes the returns, um, believe it or not happen pretty early on. So within the first 72 hours. Um, yeah, so one of the biggest reasons why we really recommend a two week shutdown, letting that animal get a chance to decompress and then start kind of introducing them to different things. Um, but if they're uh, FAS and their stress levels are much, much less when they get to that home initially, it doesn't take um, quite as long for them to be able to decompress and they can handle some additional stressors earlier on. I love what you said about monitoring them and then also sort of translating that into somebody who's adopting the dog so that they can use the same skills. And also you used a term novel enrichment. And I really like that you mentioned that because it, all enrichment is not created equal and all every dog is not going to respond the same way. One dog might enjoy a uh, really fast movement, you know, okay, playing with a tug toy or, and another dog that may be more shut down or higher on that FAS scale, that might just be horribly overwhelming. Um, or it may start to make them fearful and either shut down or start to show some like fear aggression. So for a new pet parent, or maybe somebody who has recently adopted a dog or is thinking about adopting a dog, what types of uh, pet enrichment resources or those novel types of enrichment do you recommend sort of trying out or considering or maybe reading your dog and then saying, maybe I'll try this today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one of the first things when we're talking about when you get your dog to a new house, um, a lot of people are really amped. They want to show them off. They want to get them out to the dog park and different things. And like you said, it could be very overwhelming for them. So we try to um, encourage them to do more in-home enrichment initially, let them get used to their space. Um, one thing that I really like is to allow choices. So you can find one what's actually enriching for your dog because enrichment is really only truly enrichment if it is motivating um, 
for that individual animal. So um, it might be something starting out, just getting them used to a space. Um, if there's other animals in the home, they are oftentimes separated. So they might be in a crate, they might be in an X-Pen setup or another room. Um, so food puzzles are always a good option. Um, I think you mentioned snuffle mats earlier. It's one of my favorites. Um, Cause, and lick mats, the act of actually sniffing and licking um, can be a self-soothing behavior, which can um, help uh, the animals feel a bit more secure. Um, and then once they get a little bit more comfortable with that, then starting to introduce them to those longer walks and sniffaris and maybe those hikes and things like that. Um, and uh, really, I just encourage more than anything for owners to let the animals go at their pace. Um, and like you said, if you're throwing too much at them all at once, it's going to potentially cause them to be uh, more sensitized and not give them the opportunity to decompress like they would. Um, one resource that I actually tell a lot of my students, uh, it's really simple. Most people are on social media. Facebook has a great group, a canine enrichment group. You do have to request to be added to it, but there are so many ideas and most of them are pretty inexpensive in-home um, options that people can do um, right in their backyard or inside their house. I'm a member of that group. I love that group. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I love that group is that a lot of it is DIY. Yeah. So regular people that are like, hey, I tried this with my dog. It went like gangbusters. They loved it. And mm -hmm. then other people chime in and they say, well, my dog loved it, but I made this tweak. And that's a really fun conversation. Yeah. And some of them are using, uh, you know, various tools or things that they've purchased, but a lot of it is just like, you could literally make it with stuff that you already have around your house or yeah. a novel idea. Like, oh, I haven't thought about that or introducing that to my dog or trying that with my dog. And maybe it doesn't even require anything. So very, very cool. I like that you mentioned that. That is a <laughs> for quite a while and it's fun to be able to connect with other pet parents too because they're I mean our dogs are individuals and somebody else will have a dog with some similar tendency so what works for somebody else might give you an idea to try with your own dog that's really really cool and I I love following Maryland SPCA I know you guys have a really active Facebook you've got a great great team of people who do a super job of sort of promoting the pets and showcasing them and what you guys are doing and actively working on. And I have seen some amazing videos of you using Swift Paws in your organization. And yeah. I have to thank you because as one of our first charitable partners, being able to get this into the hands of an organization that really puts it to use. And in my opinion, puts it to use in a, in a really good and healthy way. It's not just like, oh, throw them out there. Do, you know, you're really identifying which dogs will benefit most. And swift pods is a very, lure coursing is very high intense sort of activity. So if you have a dog that already is showing some prey drive or some energy level that would benefit from it, they're a great candidate. Um, but like you said, that's not going to be perfect for every dog. And at, at its heart, we care about enrichment. So if you have a dog that maybe would prefer something like a sniffari or something a little lower key, then I'm all about that too. And that's why I wanted to invite you to talk about enrichment. We're starting to grow our own community group on Facebook. It's just called Swift Paws Community. It's really simple. And what I love about that community is, yeah, people are sort of entering it on this premise of, okay, Swift Paws is cool, lower coursing is cool. This idea of taking their prey drive and turning it into play drive and watching my dog get that kind of mental and physical enrichment is awesome. And I wanted to spark the conversation of what, what's next? What else can I do with my dog? Is there something else? So the, the lick mats, the snuffle mats, just this kind of conversation is something I want to have more of in our own community and definitely in places like the canine enrichment too. Um, so I've had an awesome time talking with you before we sort of like move on and wrap things up. Uh, is there anything that you guys have going on at Maryland SPCA right now or upcoming that you want to talk about programs or specific fundraisers that you're doing? Because um, I'd want to give you a chance to highlight that now. Yeah, of course. So we are a 501c3. Um, we're a nonprofit. So we always rely on um, donations, uh, whether that be monetary or supplies, food. Not only do we require things like that, obviously at our shelter for our own animals, but we're also really big in the community and providing um, resources to people who maybe are homebound um, or financially unable to uh, care for animals. And our priority is really keeping animals, um, whether they've been adopted from us or not, in those homes. Um, so one uh, thing that we have is called 
Sorry if you can hear my dog scratching in the background. There's groaning, that's why. <laughs> um, but one of our programs is called our Kibble Connection. But basically, that is um, a way for us to give back to the community and thank them. Because um, there's a lot of people that try to support us and uh, will, you know, volunteer their time when able with COVID. Unfortunately, that's kind of come to uh, a halt at the moment. Um, but that way, we can help keep those animals in their home, um, make sure that those people are able to feed their animals because um, sometimes you you know have community members who will put their animals before themselves and we want everyone to um, be happy and healthy and able to stay in their home and um, feed every member of their family. Yeah and that's something that not everybody is going to think about naturally is that a big part of any shelter or rescue or SPCA's mission is not just to take care of the animals that find their way to them but also to take care of their community so that those animals that have a home don't lose their home. And uh, I think that that's maybe a hidden part a lot of times or it's not really talked about. So I love that you mentioned some of your community uh, driven missions. And then uh, if somebody, so hopefully this will be seen far and wide. So if somebody is interested in benefiting Maryland SPCA, how can they best do that? Um, so on our website, you'll find um, various areas where you can donate. Um, we have an Amazon wish list. Um, a lot of the times, we actually just recently sent out a plea for some uh, one of the most common items. You wouldn't think about it: squeeze cheese. It is actually extremely helpful when we've got dogs that are super pumped. They want to get out of their runs, but maybe they're not um, quite so cooperative or sitting still while we're getting harnessing on. You spray a little bit of squeeze cheese on the side of their run and it makes their lives, uh, our lives much easier and uh, much less stressful to get them harnessed and get them out quickly. Um, do the cats right now are a little bit on the neglected side as far as toys. We get a lot of donations for dogs. Sometimes people forget our, our key, uh, kitty or feline friends. Um, so wand toys are great because um, we actually have an active enrichment program for both species um, training and uh, enrichment. So we do um, active behavior modification with cats as well. And for them, sometimes food isn't really motivating, but they love toys. Um, so our cat friends have very much benefited from the Swift Paws course as well. <laughs> Just told me that I cannot wait to see some videos, but you said that you actually set it up indoors for some of the cats. We weren't quite sure how it was going to work. We got a little, uh, um, it took a little bit of creativity, but it actually sits really nicely on our um, indoor area rugs <laughs> and um, the cats had a blast. I love that. And, and again, thank you for joining us. We will be sure to put links to how people can find the best way to donate or benefit Maryland SPCA and the amazing programs that you guys have. Um, and I also am super excited because we do have some video to share with everybody of some of the pets in your care using Swift Paws. Uh, I love watching it. Every single time I see you guys publish a video about that, it literally makes my day. All right, Erin, thank you so much again for joining me for this chat. It is our first charitable partner program chat. So, and I also have to thank you and Maryland SPCA again for being one of our early adopters of the charitable partners program. Um, and if you're watching this or if you have any other organizations that you work closely with, we are accepting new charitable partners. Uh, we partner with charitable organizations. We send them donated equipment. And then hopefully we get to do more stories like this where we can showcase our partners so that Everybody who follows us in our community can get to know them a little better too. And uh, for more of these stories, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are growing it. We're adding more videos all the time. Uh, and anybody can join our community of dog lovers. It is Swift Paws Community. And you can find Maryland SPCA on Facebook for their awesome videos and the content that they put out. You can just search for Maryland, all spelled out, and then capital SPCA on Facebook to follow them as well. So thank you all so much. Piper, uh, Piper says it's nap time here. And uh, until next time, uh, everybody take care, be safe, and get your dogs out there for some fun enrichment. Thank you.